get started. It's been a bit since I've been up here, so it's nice being back. All right, so tonight we're going to go over just more or less really just the first half of Daniel chapter 2. Uh, I spent the past couple of Tuesdays expanding on chapter 1. This whole book of Daniel is, in my opinion, one of the coolest books in the entire Bible, honestly. Uh, first half of the book uh, being just narrative, the second half just being jam-packed with uh, prophecy, biblical prophecy um, of the latter days and end times. And so it's a very, very fun book. So let's just go ahead. Um, I'm going to read, um, if you'll follow along, I guess, uh, thank you, Mariah, you got it. We'll go ahead and read the um, first 11 verses. Uh, we're only going to cover maybe the first half of the chapter tonight, but we'll go ahead and read the first 11. And uh, sorry, we'll go ahead and pray, and um, we'll start to dig in and get started. All right, chapter 2, verse 1. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Verse 4, Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn from limb to limb, and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation." Uh, they answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the dream to his servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time, inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king, inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or a Chaldean. Verse 11, Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult, and there is no one else who could declare it to the king, except God's, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. All right, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you uh, again just for these Tuesday nights where we can come together and to study your word. Um, we thank you so much for these books like the book of Daniel. Um, Lord, it's been awesome to go through these prophetic books on Tuesday nights. It's been such a blessing where, as um, at least for myself personally in the past, these prophets, Lord, the books, they kind of have this cloud around where they seem intimidating um, and mysterious, but Lord, we thank you that your message is clear, that we can, um, by your Holy Spirit, understand your word, and we thank you for the lessons and the important things that you have to say to us, even through these books as well. Uh, so we thank you for this time here. I pray you bless it, and we just praise your name. Amen. All right, guys, so the book of Daniel um, again, we've already spent quite a bit of time here on Tuesday nights going through the minor prophets, and as you may or may not remember, going through some of these minor prophets like Zechariah and places like that, we've even spoken a bit in related on related history to the book of Daniel. We've kind of talked a bit about, uh, more or less explicitly not, um, or su more subtle, the 70-year captivity, Babylonian captivity. We've talked about that. We've talked about in books like Zechariah, them coming back from the 70 years of captivity that they spent here in Babylon. Um, and here we see the beginning of that. And it's quite fun to go into this book. Again, the first half of this is just straight narrative. It's just Daniel writing down, recording this um, history and telling this story. And it's such a very, very cool story, um, especially as we see a character 
like Nebuchadnezzar here. And in my opinion, just for me personally, Nebuchadnezzar is one of my favorite characters in the Bible, which is odd considering how cruel of a king he was. Um, we see that even in this chapter. Um, he has what appears to be, from my understanding, one of his personal favorite threats to tear people from limb to limb and turn their uh, houses and everything into rubbish heaps. Um, and if you look more into that and study, funny or not, it's more translated as a dunghill. So for some reason or another, this was his favorite threat. I'm going to tear you limb from limb and turn all your possessions and house into a dunghill, just straight up. And we see that repeated even also in the next chapter as well, which is the famous chapter of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going into the fiery furnace. So a lot of these stories are well known. Um, a lot of times, even then, they still get overlooked. So let's go ahead and start to dig into here into chapter 2. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. And the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams, so they came in and stood before the king. Now, I'm sure people here, and I can even just speak for myself, as we spent many years asleep, I've had our own dreams where sometimes there's a specific dream, it just it really stands out to you. And I think that some of us can say, and maybe again myself personally, there's a dream that maybe it's a nightmare and it just haunts you. And you can't get it out of your mind. You don't know what it is. I know for, even for myself personally, there was one recurring, and we won't even go into detail of that a dream, a nightmare I had as a kid, and it would recur and type thing, and it just, it just haunted me. It was just the weirdest thing, right? You lose sleep over it. Sometimes we just have that today where we just wake up in the middle of the night for whatever crazy dream we've had because of whatever food we've eaten before we fell asleep, whatever that might be, it wakes you up. You feel anxious. You feel exhausted. You feel worried. You don't understand it. Sometimes you forget it. Sometimes it sticks on your mind. For here, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the Babylon, Babylonian king, he has a dream, and it absolutely terrifies him out of his mind. And he cannot let it go. It stays on his mind, and it haunts him. And so I think as we kind of see here, whether it be because of his father prior, um, having similar situations or whatever that might be, it doesn't really seem to be that out of the ordinary when we go through this chapter here. It, seem, it seems like the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, all these wise men of Babylon, they're almost used to it at this point. It kind of seems like a normal thing. Oh, we're getting called into in the middle of the night into his chambers because he's had a dream of some sort and we got to interpret it for him. So maybe his father had that as well. Who knows? But he has this dream and it haunts him. Um, it says that his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. So again, we go into verse 2. It says, And the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans. So all the magic practicing people, all of the scholars, all of these people that are seen as the wise men of Babylon. He calls them in. There's, he is supposed to be the top guys. If anyone's supposed to have the answers, it's supposed to be these people right here. So he calls them in in the middle of the night, doesn't care because he's king. He's a cruel king. He says, you're here to serve me. So he calls him in and he demands an answer immediately. Uh, he says, and the Chaldeans tell the king his dream. So they came in and stood before the king. Verse 3, the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Now, some translations, I believe, um, if I remember, say uh, he seeks to know the dream. So there are people, commentaries and others that say that, oh, he's forgotten the dream. So we see here in the next following verses that he's demanding both the dream and the interpretation. Personally, I believe that he very much vividly remembers this dream and maybe even does understand exactly what it's saying, but is kind of hoping for a different interpretation. Now, he's a king. He's gone already before he's come back. His, um, his father had the throne, and he's off and he's uh, conquering all throughout the surrounding area. Uh, we've 
already covered that and seen bits of that covered maybe in chapter 1. And as we study the book of Daniel, we see the three different times that Jerusalem is sieged upon. And we saw Daniel and his friends taken the first time in 605. I think it's 597, I believe, where Ezekiel the prophet, another uh, prophetic book in the Old Testament, and 10,000 captives, they're taken in the Babylon as well. So that's another book that takes place during his Babylonian captivity. And then finally in 586, we see the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And so Nebuchadnezzar is responsible for all of this right here. And he finally comes back, he comes to co reign with his father, and his father suddenly dies. So now Nebuchadnezzar is top dog in the Babylonian Empire. He's the guy. He's king. He's on top. He has essentially supreme authority. And as we'll see here as we go through later in the book of Daniel, um, during the Medo-Persian Medo Empire that kind of takes over from the Babylonians, uh, we see that their kings didn't necessarily have supreme authority, but this guy does. He does what he wants. He says what he wants, whatever he wants, he has immediately. <clears throat> as evidenced as these people are just coming into the middle of the night. But with that comes worry, anxiety. you got to think that for all that coming to some sort of power, whatever that might be, one's got to think, oh, I just made it to the top. I'm here, I'm at the top of the mountain, at the peak. Meanwhile, you're thinking the entire time maybe, Who's going to come up behind me, push me off the cliff, and take my spot now? Nebuchadnezzar here has that exact worry. As we see evidence, we won't really be able to dig into that dream so much tonight, but we see evidence in the second half of this chapter exactly what that is and why he has that worry. <clears throat> so again, verse 4, he says, Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. So again, uh, something that even Roy and I were talking about beforehand was kind of cool about this book is that, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, what's really cool about the book is that in this portion right here, chapter 2, verse 4, we see a switch, as it says right here, even in the verse, to Aramaic, right? It goes from the beginning of the book, is written in Hebrew, it switches to Aramaic. Excuse me for one second. All right, there we go. So, the reason for that being... It's Aramaic at the time, um, just as Greek in the New Testament, Aramaic is the common language of the time. And so commentators and others believe that the reason it switches to Aramaic is that this portion of the book is really meant for that broader audience, the message that it has here and the story that it's telling. It's meant to reach more people for the importance of that message, whatever that might be here. So we see here... Verse 2, um, chapter 2, verse 4, and it lasts in Aramaic until about, uh, I think it's the end or the middle of chapter 7. Um, and that's kind of where we hit that middle break and we go into the second half of the, again, the book. Daniel switches back to Hebrew, and we see that's when it really goes into the heavy prophecy, because the reason for that being it goes back in Hebrew, because that's meant for God's people, the people of Israel. So, just a quick side note, this is an interesting fun fact says, again, they speak to the king in Aramaic. <coughs> it says, O king, live forever. I'm trying to butter him up, really, essentially. The flatter him says, Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. So again, here we see them. They're flattering him up. You know, they're probably used to it at this point. Again, this is seen as the normal procedure of business. He's got a dream. We're going to tell him it. He's going to tell us the dream. And we're going to explain it to them. They'll come up with whatever nonsense they can. That way they can go back to sleep, really. And it says here, the king replies to the Chaldeans in verse 5, <clears throat> The command for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be made a rubbish heap, or, again, a dunghill. So... If I'm the wise man of Babylon at this time, as we see here, I think, in these coming verses as well, they're a bit confused because this is a bit out of the ordinary. As they're probably thinking at this point, and they even state explicitly towards the end here in uh, verse 11, 
no, no one asks such a thing. The king is saying, hey, I had this dream, I want its interpretation, but no, you got, you got to tell me the dream and the interpretation. Which, are, it just completely throws them off. Like, why would you not just simply tell us the dream and then we explain it? I think really at this point, and again, maybe it's just my opinion, but for the sake of filler, I think at this point, he's really just not trusting his wise men. He's trying to test them right now. These are the same guys that were with his father. He's trying to figure out who he can trust, who he can't. He's already anxious and nervous over the idea of maybe losing his power as a result of this dream. And he's worried about staying on top. And we see here he's trying to test his wise men of Babylon. So he says, no, you guys have to tell me the dream itself and its interpretation. It says, verse 6, But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the dream. I can just imagine the nervous anxiety in their voices as they're saying this, but let, let the king tell us the dream to his servants, and he will declare the interpretation. The king replies, Verse 8, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time, which frankly I think we can probably safely assume they really are bargaining for time at this point, panicked, trying to figure out how they're going to get out of this one. Uh, but he says, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time, <clears throat> inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words for me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. So again, they're nervous, they're panicked. More or less, they're starting to get exposed at this point for being frauds, more, more or less. They're really, really starting to get nervous and panicked. Probably broke out into a sweat thinking, how the heck are we supposed to know this guy's dream? He won't give us any hint whatsoever. If we say one wrong thing, you know, we get torn limb for limb and turn into a dunghill. Like, they're kind of stuck into it between a rock and a hard place at this point. It says the Chaldeans answered the king and said, which really is more also just kind of foolish at this point, but they're desperate. They said, there is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king. Inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Now the fact alone that they, he didn't just simply kill them at this point is amazing, in my opinion. Um, but they're like, no one, no one has ever asked this before. No, it, it can't be asked. It can't be done. Again, they go over, says, moreover, verse 11, the thing which the king demands is difficult. It's, or in the translation, it's rare. There is no one else who could declare it to the king except God's, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. And I think as we see here, uh, just as they say, the only people that can declare it to the king is except God's. We see here, again, ultimately, the God, um, God of Israel, ends up being the one that exactly gives him the interpretation of his dream. <clears throat> so, what that says in verse 12, Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill him. So, reading this verse kind of tells me and gives me the idea and thought, Daniel and his friends may not have even been present when the wise men are called into there. I was kind of thought that, <coughs> excuse me, it's kind of thought that it's towards the end of his three years of training uh, for Daniel and his friends when this occurs. And so maybe that's the reason why they're not necessarily there. Um, but we see that they're, they're not even present. They're not there for this whole entire scene. This feels like some absolutely crazy movie just 
watching these scenes in my head as we read through this. All right, just ridiculous requests. But Daniel's friends aren't there. And so suddenly they're being sought to be killed as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so again, the decree goes forth that the wise men should be slain. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is more or less really just kind of lost his patience at this point. Excuse me. Um, he's lost his patience at this point, and is demanding to answer. He's not getting anything from them. So again, he issues the decree that they all be torn limb from limb. Verse fourteen says <coughs> uh, says that Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. So again, Daniel and his friends, I'm sure, being taken completely off guard by this. Just, they know uh, at this point the reputation that the king has. They know he could be completely irrational, unreasonable, ridiculously cruel, and the kind of had an idea of what to expect, and they know if they don't act fast, then we're all doomed. But it says here that he replies with discretion and discernment. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, not only uh, is he panicked, but in the midst of this panic, he's still acting with wisdom. He's still acting with the wisdom from God. And you see, he's here discretion. So it talks about discretion. The really definition being. Um, <coughs> uh, excuse me, I don't know, Mariah, you can give me some water or something. Um, sorry, guys. Um, but discretion being real here, saying that he's seeking to come before the king without offending him. He's trying to be careful. He's trying to be cautious. Um, but he uses dis um, discretion and discernment and trying to figure out how they're going to get out of this. Verse 15, <clears throat> he said to Arioch, the king's commander, quote, what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Again, they're trying to figure out. They don't even know what's going on. They weren't there. They don't know of the dream. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, man. Um, okay, that's better. <clears throat> All right. Sorry, I got coffee up here, and that doesn't really necessarily help as much with the throat. Um, for what reason is the decree from the king so urgent that Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, informs Daniel about the matter? So again, they don't know what's going on. They don't know about the dream. And so they're told the situation. And normally, at people at this point will go into an absolute panic. I know I would personally. I'd be freaked out wondering how on earth am I supposed to get out of this one. Here in America, when we have something come up in our own lives, and maybe I think th this is rather uh, big in America, we're, we're very pragmatic in our thinking. We think, okay, this is the issue at hand. This is what's going on. I got to do this, this, and this. So then that will fix this issue, and then this will come up as a result. Kind of like chess, thinking like a couple moves ahead, and okay, so once this happens, i got to take care of that, and so on. It's all, But that's always the thought process is, okay, I have to do this. I have to do that. Here, we don't see that from Daniel and his friends. We see in the next few verses that they immediately go to prayer. They immediately, which is, is both wise awesome and hilarious to see at the same time, their reaction is to call a prayer meeting. That's what they do. So this was Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. It says, Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Again, they're more better known, I think, and it's unfortunate, better known by their Babylonian names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and he informs them about the matter. Verse 18, 
so that they might request compassion <coughs> from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So their very, again, very first uh, reaction is to go to God in prayer. And even just speaking for myself personally, I think that that is something that does not happen enough. I know my reaction when something happens, whatever that may be goes on in my life, is to just freak out. I usually just you know, have freak out. I'm wondering, okay, this is overwhelming. This is happening. How do I fix this? How, do, how does this happen? What, what do I have to do? What do I have to buy? What, whatever that is. Where do I get the money for this? Right? It's usually the immediate thought process. Sometimes, or all the time, we just have to take the time, slow down, and go to God with the issue. And go to God and ask Him. It says here that they request compassion. They request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So that Daniel and his friends uh, would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So, again, they're requesting compassion from God. It's not because they're going to God. Often the whole popular idea is as well in thought process in some churches that, well, God's not going to listen to you if you don't have your life straight. You know, you have to make sure that you're completely 100% straight or God's not going to do this for you. God's not going to answer your prayers. They're going to God not off the merit of their own character, but of the merit of God himself. They're requesting the mercy and grace and compassion from God himself. So again, verse 19 says, Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. And then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. It says um, that right away, again, it says the mystery was revealed in a vision. So a vision being he was awake. Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel was wide awake when he receives the answer from the Lord, maybe even in the middle of the prayer meeting. But he receives the answer. So again, at this point, if I'm Daniel... Immediately, I've probably like, okay, this is the answer right here. I'm racing off. I'm going to go try and tell Nebuchadnezzar and them right away so that not all of the rest of us are still getting killed off while this is all happening. Daniel's first, very first um, reaction isn't that. He, he goes to God again in prayer, which is so hilarious to me when I think about my own life when... Um, it's so common we we pray to God and say, God, okay, we and we're we're thinking, okay, we've done the right thing now. We're going to God, Lord, I bring this to you. X Y Z fill in the blank. This is what's going on. I need help with this, Lord. Please help me. And God answers, and maybe He takes care of it. He gives the answer, whatever that might be, and maybe He takes care of it in the exact way that you wanted Him to. And then you react, okay, this is awesome. Thank you, God. And then you just kind of go off about your business. You're like, cool, that was taken care of. But here, Daniel and his friends, they, they take the time and slow down. And they come back to the person who they know needs to receive all of the glory. They, all, all of the great, they be grateful for the work here that God's doing. It says here, Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said in verse 20, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. For wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Verse 23 says, To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. So we see here immediately his response is worship. It's it's immediately it's worship. He's gone to God, he makes the request of God, God answers it, but he doesn't just run off excited, okay, that's done, it's taken care of, I'm good to go. 
on to the next thing on my to-do list. You know, he stops and takes the time to worship. And I think of all the times where, here in this church, where we've had whatever issue is going on, whatever need we might have, and we think, as I mean, think back to the air conditioning, we, you know, we're panicked because we know summer is coming. Summer is coming, and we know we're about to have a congregation that's probably going to be sitting in the middle of the sermon sweating bullets. And we're panicked. We're thinking, how on earth are we going to take care of this? What are we going to do? Where the heck are we going to get the money? What are we going to have to sell in order to get this money? We, we, we thought the same thing with these chairs that you're sitting in right now. We're thinking, we're starting to grow. The Lord's doing work here. We're about to run out of chairs. What do we do? And every time that we've just taken the time to slow down, gone to God, focus on Him, and making the request before Him, presenting whatever it might be, He's answered the prayer. He dropped 150 or so of these chairs on our lap, free of charge, out of nowhere, while we were spending the entire time thinking, where on earth are we going to get this money? I remember the whole process of where we're going through, okay, this is how we're pricing them. This is what's going to come out to. This is the amount we need. Just out of nowhere, it drops into our lap. But when those things happen in life, we need to be able to make sure we take the time, slow down, and focus on the Lord. And our proper response should be worship. What was he here? And we're reminded of just God and his character. Again, he changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He has full control, and God is sovereign. <clears throat> he gives wisdom to the wise men and knowledge to men and understanding. As he reveals the profound and hidden things, he knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him. He knows all things. Truth belongs to God. It says, To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. You have given me wisdom and power. So again, we see he's full control. He's sovereign. Truth belongs to God. And he grants wisdom and power to those that are in need and ask of it. <clears throat> it says, verse 24, it says, Therefore Daniel went in to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and spoke to him as follows, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon, Take me into the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king. It says, verse 25, uh, 25 Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man. Wow, that's it, kind of arrogant and just hilarious to see this guy's trying to move up in the ranks now. It's like, I found a guy. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah, king who can make the interpretation known to the king. That's just, that's just hilarious to me to see and observe that. Um, what we see here, Daniel's rushing off now. Okay, he's got the answer. He's given, taking the time to respond and worship God. It says, the king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was his Babylonian name, it says, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen in its interpretation? It says, verse 27, <clears throat> it says, Daniel said, answered before the king and said, <clears throat> as for the mystery about which the king has inquired. Again, he kind of goes off saying the same thing that's very similar to the wise men of Babylon. At first, he says, now the wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners <clears throat> are able to declare it to the king. You got to think at this point, Nebuchadnezzar is like, I, I just heard this. I've just heard this. Do I have to? I'm just going ahead and I'm getting ready to go ahead and lay out the decree. Just kill you on the spot as well. It says, however, verse 28, there is a God, not gods, a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. Verse 29, as for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what will take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made to known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me. 
for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. And so we see here, even in his coming before the king, Daniel displays the humility and recognizes who came to the rescue here, who had the solution. He didn't just simply go to the king and say, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, I got the answer. It's right here. You're good to go. Please don't kill everyone. He says, no, I, I don't have the answer. None of your wise men are going to have the answer. No wise men here on earth can have the answer. God has the answer. He makes sure ultimately at the end that he gives the glory to God. And I think oftentimes that in our faith, in our faith, in our relationship with God, and we believe He's all-powerful. We believe that He's King of kings, Lord of lords. We believe that He's omnipotent, omniscient. We know His character. We study the Bible. I think sometimes when we say, and we do maybe believe those things, we don't necessarily personalize it. We hear about someone that might be going through a tough time, Maybe someone's sick. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend, whoever it might be. And you pray for them. You say, we, we know that God can take care of that. We know that God can heal them. We know that God is right there with them. But change is a bit when it becomes a bit more personal. It cha- it, for some reason, in our nature, we think that when it's happening to us and we're in the midst of a panic, and this crisis has happened in my life. My response is going to absolute panic mode and my mind gets all jumbled up and I'm thinking, okay, how do I fix this? We believe that God can and does do it for other people. Oftentimes, for some reason, I believe we seem to make the mistake that God isn't going to do it for me, that he can't do it for me. It kind of goes from an active faith to a passive faith, in a way. And I got to say, that's, it's, it's convicting to think about that. Now, it's my personal belief here. I talked with uh, Roy, and for those sitting at the table, what I've heard before, uh, before we started here, we're just talking about all throughout the book of Daniel. And in chapter 3, it's the more, again, one of the more famous stories of the Bible with the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And just, again, for me personally, this is one thing that really, really stood out to me. I was just reading through this. <coughs> it says here, I'm going to fast forward for a second. It's a bit of a spoiler. So it'll be a few weeks again before we're back here on Tuesday night for Daniel. So hopefully you don't mind the spoilers. But says here in chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar is threatening Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with throwing them to the fiery furnace because they refused to bow down to this like 90-foot golden idol. They were they're refusing to say, we're going to stay committed to God and faithful to God. And this is one thing that really stood out to me. It says in verse 16 to 18, chapter 3, it says, <coughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. He's telling, they're telling him at this point, we don't got to give you an answer as to why we're refusing to abound to your idol. We don't have to. Verse 17, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the supernus of the blazing fire. <coughs> he will deliver us, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O oh king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are now going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. At least, again, I read these verses, and I think that's got to be their exact mindset they had in chapter 2. That's got to be our mindset when we pray in our relationship with God. we got to believe that our God, whom we serve, is able he is able. 
I go on to say that he will, he that believes, he's able to deliver us. And I believe that he will deliver us. But again, I think it's verse 18 that even stands out even more. It says, even if he does not, we will still choose to worship him and stay faithful to him. See, oftentimes when we go to God in our prayer life, and this was one of the things that Daniel's kind of known for, is his prayer life. It's ultimately what gets him in trouble and thrown into the lion's den, the even more famous story. <coughs> it says here, this should be our, our mindset in our prayers. God, God is able. We have to believe that. We believe it for others. And oftentimes we make the mistake. We don't necessarily believe it for ourselves. But we got we got to stay faithful to that and committed to that and believing that God is able. He, he will deliver us. <clears throat> but it's even if he does not. So again, we have our prayer requests. We come before the Lord. We say, God, I need this. God, I want this. I want this to happen in life. You know, these are the plans, my life goals that I've put together um, over years, Lord. This is what I want to see happen for my life. And maybe we even get frustrated or bitter with God if whatever it is that we have planned didn't exactly work out like we wanted it to. But it's something I think that serves as a great reminder that we have to have to strive to remember is that even if He does not, our will does not, it will not necessarily always line up with God's. But when we pray, we need to make sure that we're ultimately praying for God's will. Whatever that is. Sometimes it's not always God's will for a person to live a 100% healthy life. Maybe they're struck with sickness. Whatever that might be. And we think, why God? Like, why, why does this have to happen? What purpose could there possibly be? And if I could just turn to, I think it's John chapter 9. And we've just gone through this in the school of ministry as well, as we're going uh, through our chuck tracks. In John chapter 9, we see uh, Jesus heal a blind man. We see here at the beginning of the chapter that it's told us that he was blind from birth. He was born that way. So again, most people would probably simply look at that and see, there is no good God. There is no God. Why on earth would someone be born blind? What purpose could there possibly be? <clears throat> it says here, Jesus answered in verse 3. John 9, verse 3 he says, Jesus answered. Because they're pondering over whether, you know, is this his own guy's sin? Is it because his family sinned? Why has why this happened to him? Jesus replies, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Sometimes in life, things happen so that others are pointed to Him, to God. we got to stay with that when we come before God and we submit to Him. When we submit to the Lord and say as Christians, Okay, God, I give you my all. I give you my life. You are my everything. Whatever it is you have, you have for me, it's your will. Maybe his will isn't going to line up with the picture-perfect idea that you have for your life. Coming again with that, even if he does not, even if he does not do what you believe that he can and will, and might not necessarily. Ultimately, at the end of the day, whatever that is, that crisis that's happening, that it has happened, will happen, that God gets the glory out of it. So that's what Daniel does here in chapter 2. Now, we haven't necessarily touched the actual dream itself, but here I think it's so important, even just in this first half of the chapter, Daniel and his friends and company, they go to God, they make sure immediately they go to God and call a prayer meeting. And they trust God with this. They say, okay, God, this is way out of our hands. We don't have the answer here. We're, we're giving this all to you. We're laying this on the line, just asking, requesting for more time. I'm giving this to you. And we see here that the response is worship. 
Their proper response is worship. So, there's the popular song, um, which again, Roy and I, we talked about, this Dare to Be a Daniel. And I think oftentimes with that song, it's misdirected. And we think that, okay, I gotta, I gotta be, I have the, the goal, the message, the idea is I gotta be just like Daniel. Well, Paul in the New Testament, he, he talks, and he, there's a verse that says, um, you know, be an uh, uh, be an imitator of me in my life. Paul is trying to tell um, those that he's writing to is act as imitators of me. But he goes on and he specifies even more. So he says, imitators as I'm following Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. So the idea is don't just simply imitate Paul. Imitate Christ himself. Follow Christ and stay committed to Christ. Christ himself, as we see through that same gospel, the Gospel of John, there were several times where it's mentioned specifically that he goes off by himself to pray. And oftentimes that's overlooked because it seems like a throwaway verse here and there. But we're not to be dare to be like Daniel. We're dare to be like Christ. If Christ himself had to take the time every once in a while to try and go off to the side alone and pray, what makes us think that we can really do the same and go through life, uh, not the same, go through life without prayer, without coming to God and racing to God? And that, that's my prayer is that my prayer is that we do go to prayer, that we remember that God is ultimately fully sovereign, fully in control, just as Daniel says here in his prayer of worship, that he's sovereign, he's in full control, he knows all things, and he'll grant wisdom and help to those in time of need. So that would be my prayer here, that we, we remember to go to God and whatever that might be, whatever situation, we ultimately, again, at the end of it, we give the glory to God in that proper due respect and honor to Him. Let's go ahead and pray. Now, dear Lord, we thank You for this night that You've given us here. We thank You for Daniel, and uh, we thank You for the example that he and his friends gave us. Uh, uh, Lord, I pray that we remember that the, the goal is not to dare to be like Daniel, um, but Lord, to be more like you, to reflect your character and your heart more to others. That Lord, even in our, with our discretion and discernment like Daniel, Lord, that we, we seek you in prayer, that we give you the honor and the glory that's due you, Lord, rightfully. <clears throat> I pray, Lord, that we model that idea that, Lord, even for ourselves personally, that we remember this in our own lives, that you are able, Lord, that you are able, and that we believe that you are able and that you will, but, Lord, ultimately, even if you don't, that you know all things, just as Daniel said here, you know all things, truth belongs to you. You're fully sovereign and in control, and Lord, ultimately, at the end of the day, you know what's best. So, Lord, I pray that even if, with that, that we believe you're able and will, but even if you don't, that we still give you all the glory and honor. We thank you for this, Lord, and we just praise in your name. Amen.